and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. Today I want to start a trilogy of videos about chemical equilibrium. You're probably already familiar with this equation, which tells you the equilibrium constant for a reversible chemical reaction. As you might recall, the equilibrium constant is a number that doesn't have a unit. However, there are many cases in which the expression for K seems as though it should have a unit. For example, consider this simple chemical reaction in which aqueous iodic acid dissociates to form hydrogen ions and the iodate ion. If we write out the expression for the equilibrium constant, we get this. The concentrations all have units of molarity. That means this expression would seem to have units of molarity squared in the numerator and just molarity in the denominator. That would give us units of molarity overall for the equilibrium constant. So why don't we have units for K? That's one thing we'll find out today. It turns out that the equilibrium really doesn't have units, and the reason the expression seems to contradict this is because we're actually leaving something out of the equation. To unravel that mystery, let's start by thinking about a simple reversible reaction in the gas phase, like this. The lowercase letters represent the coefficients of the balanced reaction. Since this is a generic reaction, there's not much that we know about it. However, if it's at equilibrium, we do know that the Gibbs free energy of the process is zero. So let's think a little more about the Gibbs free energy. We'll start by writing the total derivative of the Gibbs free energy. To do that, we need to think about what the variable parameters of this system are. As we saw when we took the total derivative of g in video 29, two of them are the pressure and temperature. Back in that video, we also had the number of moles of the reactants as variables. However, in that example, we were looking at an irreversible reaction. This time, since the reaction is reversible, we actually need to worry about the number of moles of each of the compounds, no matter which side of the reaction they're on. That gives us this as the total derivative. Notice that since there are six parameters total, each of the partial derivatives has five different parameters that are being held constant. This looks like an inconveniently large equation, but actually it turns out that we've learned that each one of those partial derivatives is equal to another property. The partial of g with respect to t is equal to the negative of the entropy. The partial with respect to p is equal to the volume. And each of the other partial derivatives is equal to the chemical potential of either a, b, c, or d. Applying those simplifications gives us this. It's very common to have experiments where the pressure is constant. For example, by performing the reaction in an open beaker or flask. That means we can drop out the term with dp in it from this equation. If we also perform the reaction at constant temperature, that means we can drop out the dt term too. Now, with this equation in mind, let's think a little more about the reversible reaction we're studying. Suppose the reaction shifts a little toward the right side. In that case, the number of moles of each compound will change a bit. The moles of A and B will decrease, and the moles of C and D will increase. The change in the number of moles will depend on the stoichiometric coefficient on the compound in the balanced reaction. So, the change in the number of moles of A is given by the coefficient little a multiplied by a degree of change, which will give the lowercase Greek letter xi. So, since the reaction is shifting to the right, the amount of compound A is decreasing. So D and A, the change in the number of moles of A, is equal to the negative of A times D xi. Similarly, the change in the moles of B is negative B times D xi. And the changes in the moles of C and D are positive C or positive D times D xi. If we plug those into our equation for the change in the Gibbs free energy, here's what we get. I'll simplify this a bit by dividing the whole equation by d xi. That gives us a partial derivative on the left side. And on the right side, I'll rearrange the terms a bit so that we're not starting with a negative sign anymore. 
That partial derivative on the left side is just the change in the Gibbs free energy over the course of the reaction. In other words, it's delta G. One thing to remember about this reaction is that the compounds are all gases. If their partial pressures aren't too large, they'll all behave approximately like ideal gases. Under those conditions, you might remember this equation, which we saw in video 35. Using the definition of the activity, we can write this similar equation that will help us out in our current situation. In this equation, mu naught is the chemical potential at standard pressure, which is one bar, and P naught is standard pressure. If we plug that expression for the chemical potential into our equation, we'll get an important and very useful equation. Let's shuffle this equation around a little bit. First, we'll group all the terms containing a logarithm. Next, let's factor out RT from the logarithm terms. Now take a look at those first four terms. If we compare them to the equation we had earlier for the Gibbs free energy, we can see that those four terms are just equal to the Gibbs free energy at standard pressure. Now come the important steps. As you probably know, a constant multiplied by a logarithm is equal to the logarithm of the item raised to a power equal to the constant. If we apply that to the logarithms in our equation, we get this. Also, the sum of two logarithms is equal to the logarithm of the product of the two items we're taking the logarithm of. Similarly, the difference between two logarithms is just the logarithm of the quotient of the two items. If we apply that to the logarithms in our equation, here's what we get. Notice that the denominator in each of those four fractions is the standard pressure, which is equal to 1 bar. Since p naught is equal to 1, we usually drop the denominators out of the large fraction, which gives us this. But notice what this means. The original fractions all had no units overall, because the numerators and denominators all had units of bars, and all of those cancelled out. Now that we've hidden the denominators, it looks like the units might not cancel out anymore. But because each of these pressures is actually being divided by p naught, the units really do always cancel out, so the overall fraction doesn't have a unit. As we'll see soon, that gives us the reason that k, the equilibrium constant, really is a unitless number. You might recognize that the large fraction is also known as q, the reaction quotient. It's the ratio of pressures between the products and reactants in a gas phase reaction, whether or not it's at equilibrium. So what happens when we are at equilibrium? Well, we know that delta G is equal to zero at equilibrium, so we can put that on the left side. Also, at equilibrium, Q is equal to K, the equilibrium constant, so let's make that change. If I move delta G naught to the left side, here's what we get. So, this tells us that at equilibrium, the standard Gibbs free energy, that is, the Gibbs free energy at standard pressure, is equal to negative rt logarithm of k. That's an equation you may also have learned in general chemistry. Notice that we used a gas phase reaction in our example, and so we use pressures in deriving the fraction represented by the equilibrium constant. If we're looking at aqueous solutions, we can get a similar equation, but we use concentrations instead of pressures. When we do, that large fraction we had earlier looks like this. The denominator in each fraction is called the standard concentration, and it's equal to 1 molar. So, just as we did with the earlier equation, we can drop out the denominators because they're all equal to 1, and the final equations we get are very similar to the ones we got for our gas phase reaction. Let's try an example. Suppose we have this reaction, and at equilibrium, the pressures of the gases are 0.800 atmospheres for sulfur trioxide, 
0.0285 for sulfur dioxide, and 0.0142 for oxygen. What's the equilibrium constant? Because all the compounds are gases, we can use the pressures in our equilibrium expression, which looks like this. Remember that we need to use 2 for the exponent on the SO2 and SO3. We plug in the data from the question, and that gives us an equilibrium constant of 1.80 times 10 to the minus 5. Notice that this number is much less than 1, so this example is another reaction that favors the reactants. As I mentioned earlier, the equilibrium constant of a reaction is a very useful piece of information. Once we know the equilibrium constant, it will always be the same number for that reaction, and that'll help us make helpful predictions about the final concentrations in the reaction. For example, suppose we perform that last reaction again, but this time we start with different amounts of gases. When it reaches equilibrium, we find out we have 1.00 atmospheres for sulfur trioxide and 0.0350 for oxygen. What's the pressure of the sulfur dioxide? We already know the equilibrium expression for this reaction, which is this. We'll plug in the pressures for SO3 and oxygen. We also know the value of K, which we calculated in the last problem. It's 1.80 times 10 to the minus 5. So now we can solve for the pressure. Don't forget that the pressure here has an exponent on it, so we'll need to take the square root in order to get the pressure by itself. We get 5.14 times 10 to the minus 4 for p squared. Now we take the square root and find that we get 0.0227 atmospheres. Notice that this is only the pressure of the sulfur dioxide. The total pressure in the container would be the sum of all the different partial pressures. So in this case, that's 0.0227 atmospheres for the SO2, plus 1.00 for the SO3, and 0.0350 for the oxygen, which gives us a total pressure of 1.06 atmospheres. There's one last thing to know about equilibrium constants. As we've seen, when you have gases in a reaction, you can calculate the equilibrium constant using either the pressures or the concentrations. However, these won't both give you the same number as a result for K. K will be different depending on whether we use concentrations or pressures. For that reason, when we write the value of K for a reaction that has gases in it, we should use the symbol Kc or Kp instead of just K, so that we know whether it was calculated using concentrations or pressures. But sometimes we want a specific one of these. We want to know K based on concentrations or pressures. Fortunately, we can convert from one to the other using this equation. In this equation, R is the gas law constant, which you might remember is 0.08206 liters times atmospheres divided by kelvins times moles. And the temperature should be in kelvins. The exponent up here needs a little explanation. It's the coefficients of all the products minus the coefficients of all the reactants in the balanced reaction. In this case, there are two of each, but you could have more or fewer coefficients depending on the balanced reaction. For example, in the previous problem, we calculated the equilibrium constant using pressures. What would be the value of Kc at 25.0 degrees Celsius? Here's that reaction again. We're looking for Kc, so we'll plug in all the other data. We had 1.80 times 10 to the minus 5 for Kp, and our temperature is 298.15 Kelvin. The exponent will be all the product coefficients minus all the reactant coefficients. So that's 2 plus 1 minus 2 for a total exponent of 1. That gives us 24.466 in the parentheses on the right side. When we solve for Kc, we get 7.36 times 10 to the minus 7. Notice that that's significantly different from the Kp we got, 
Well, that's enough new material for now. When we meet again, we'll talk more about the equilibrium constant and what we can do with it. It's one of the most central concepts in all of chemistry, and it's something you'll use no matter what branch of chemistry is your favorite, so I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week!